Perfecto. Bueno, entonces eh, damos comienzo a esta nueva sesión de, del Buenos Aires Shoulder. Y en este caso tenemos otra vez invitados de lujo, a los que estamos muy agradecidos. Eh, planteamos hacer una reunión amena sobre un tema súper complejo, que son los déficits de capital óseo eh, cuando uno se enfrenta a un paciente con artrosis. Así que sin mucha más introducción, eh, Luciano, si querés, empezamos con el programa, presentamos a los oradores y avanzamos. Dale, perfecto, Maxi. Bueno, hoy, como decía Maxi, la verdad, otro lujo nos damos. Eh, vamos a tener eh, en primer lugar a Eric Riquetti. Eh, Eric es eh, un cirujano con amplia experiencia en reconstrucción del número proximal. Es actualmente el jefe de la división de hombro de la Cleveland Clinic. Eh, es un cirujano que tiene muchísima experiencia con múltiples publicaciones y premios internacionales eh, y él nos va a hablar eh, principalmente de lo que es el manejo de la artrosis primaria de hombro enfocado en la prótesis anatómica. En segundo lugar vamos a tener una presentación del de doctor Lionel Nitón, también eh, un profesional con muchísima experiencia en, en toda la cirugía de hombro y principalmente en todo lo que es reconstrucción del miembro superior. Eh, Lionel se formó con cirujanos como Gilles Walsh y Pascal Gualó y ahora es parte del equipo de Gilles Walsh en, en el Centro Ortopedic Santí en, en Lyon. También eh, miembro de honor de, de múltiples eh, sociedades internacionales de hombro y ganador de un montón de premios internacionales, así que es un lujo tenerlo también a Lionel. Eh, en tercer lugar vamos a tener a José Rodríguez Díaz, también José eh, hizo su especialización en la Universidad de Niños en Estados Unidos, en la residencia y después hizo una formación eh, en todo lo que es eh, reconstrucción del miembro superior en la Cleveland Clinic con Gianotti y el doctor Riquetti. Eh, José nos va a hacer una presentación de algunos casos para discutir eh, y, y bueno, y en el panel de expertos también vamos a tener al doctor Radaleta, eh, jefe del equipo de hombro del Hospital Italiano y su jefe del servicio de ortopedia y traumatología del Hospital Italiano. Así que bueno, si les parece bien, empezamos con eh, Eric Riquetti, que va a empezar con su primera presentación. Eric, si quieres empezar. Gracias. Well, thank you for having me, Luciano. It's an honor to be here and present. Um, I'm going to be talking about when to use anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty for managing glenoid bone loss and glenohumeral osteoarthritis. So we know that posterior glenoid bone loss is common in glenohumeral osteoarthritis, and it can lead to these associated pathologies, including glenoid retroversion, joint line mealization, and posterior humeral head subluxation. And we most commonly see these collection of pathologies with our Walsh B2 and B3 glenoids when we look at both the original classification and the modified classification. And when more mild pathology is present, we can use typical standard techniques to address this pathology at the time of surgery. But these pathologies become more challenging when we get into more moderate or severe posterior glenoid bone loss in the B2 and B3 glenoids. And this can become more challenging to address this pathology with standard techniques at the time of surgery. So if we look at our options available to us for correcting posterior glenoid bone loss with anatomic arthroplasty, eccentric reaming is our most common technique and prior literature has shown that there's a limit of about 15 to 20 degrees of correction of retroversion that we can achieve with this technique. But in cases that exceed this limit, which we can see in more advanced B2 and B3 pathology, we have potentially two problems that can arise. If we try to avoid excessive correction, incomplete correction potentially has negative clinical consequences for leaving a component in persistent retroversion. Or in cases of more advanced pathology, if we try to overcorrect beyond this limit of 15 or 20 degrees, we potentially cause excessive bone removal, joint line mealization, peg perforation, and narrowing of the diameter of the glenoid that potentially has negative consequences for implant stability over time. And there's clinical evidence for both of these potential concerns. In the study by Ho et al. from our institution, the significance of a retroverted component was evaluated. You can see that in this series, there were 66 anatomic arthroplasties followed at 3.8 years of minimum follow-up radiographically. And they found in this study that components were, that were left in 15 degrees or more of retroversion 
were significantly associated with a five-fold increased odds of osteolysis around the central peg of the glenoid component, which you can see here in A, which raises concern for implant loosening. And with regards to more full corrections, in this classic study by Dr. Walsh, they evaluated treatment of B2 glenoids with anatomic arthroplasty and standard eccentric reaming. This was a series of 92 cases with a cemented keeled standard glenoid component and they attempted full corrections to between zero and 10 degrees of retroversion at surgery, but found that only 66% of patients were either satisfied or very satisfied at mean 77 month follow up with a 20% rate of radiographic loosening, including 58% of these cases showing actual shift of the component and a 12% rate of revision for either loosening or instability. And they found that loose glenoids were significantly associated with worse preoperative pathology, whether measured by retroversion, bone loss, and humeral head subluxation. So we potentially need other options to address more advanced pathology uh, beyond standard eccentric reaming, which can cause excessive bone removal and negative consequence. So if we look at our different options based on severity, with mild bone loss, I think we can use standard eccentric reaming to address the pathology that's present without excessive bone removal. But as we move into either moderate or severe bone loss, we start to reach the limits of eccentric reaming and other options are potentially considered in these scenarios. More recently, we've begun to use posterior augmentation to address this more advanced bone loss. Traditionally, this has been done with posterior bone grafting, but we now have augmented glenoid components that are becoming more widely available. And then for even more advanced uh, bone loss, we now routinely use reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. But I think the question in all these scenarios is how do we determine which option is best? And once we choose an option, how we uh, put the implant in the, uh, the shoulder at the time of surgery. And with preoperative 3D CT planning, we've been able to better make these decisions. It's been shown in multiple studies that 3D CT is more accurate for the assessment of glenoid pathology. This includes bone loss and version when we compare it to standard X-rays or standard 2D CT imaging. And as a result, multiple commercially available softwares have been developed with 3D CT for preoperative planning that allow us to better determine the implant we want to use at surgery. I routinely will obtain preoperative CAT scans on all my arthroplasty cases and preoperatively plan these cases. I can determine the amount of pathologic correction I want to achieve prior to surgery. And I think most importantly, determine the type of implant I want to achieve to I want to use to achieve this correction, whether it's with an anatomic arthroplasty, an augment, or a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. But even with this preoperative planning software, we still have to de determine what our optimal glenoid component position is. This has not been well defined in the literature, but we have looked at the glenoid vault model as a group, as a potential target for determining optimal glenoid implant position. This glenoid vault model is a standardized three-dimensional model that's been shown to be a highly consistent and conserved shape across normal individuals. You can see a picture of this vault model on a normal glenoid on the right. And we've done multiple studies that show that this model is predictive of pre-morbid pre or native anatomy with regards to version, inclination, and joint line when it's placed in a pathologic glenoid. So this model is a potential target that can be used to help determine implant position at the time of surgery. So if we see an example of how this vault model would uh, fit in a pathologic glenoid, you can see the vault model placed in a B2 glenoid here with the pre-morbid version of this vault model nicely fitting the preserved paleoglenoid of this B2 and showing the area of posterior glenoid bone loss in this B2 glenoid. So if we think more specifically about goals of component placement, if we attempt to place a glenoid component to restore version, inclination, and joint line to the pre-morbid state, studies with this vault model and other studies of native anatomy have shown that version typically should be corrected to not necessarily neutral version, but within neutral to seven or eight degrees of retroversion to reach the pre-morbid state. Again, in the setting of a paleoglenoid, we also, uh, sorry, in the setting of a B2 glenoid, we have the preserved paleoglenoid as a target for version correction. With inclination, the vault model and other studies have shown that around zero to 10 degrees of inclination is normal or pre-morbid and can be a target to correct to. And then finally with joint line, again, in the setting of the B2 glenoid, we have the preserved paleoglenoid that you can see here as a target for joint line correction. 
And with these targets in mind, we can then choose the implant that's best able to accomplish the goals of surgery. And when using an anatomic implant, I will typically plan these surgeries to try to maximize full backside contact of the implant and with avoiding excessive bone removal and peg perforation. So if we move into the realm of posture augmentation, prior to having implants available, bone graft was our historical technique for this. And typically this requires use of the humeral head autograph from the resected humeral head for primary arthroplasty. You can see in the literature that both uh, techniques of using a matched articular surface of the graft or creating a step cut graft have been utilized. This procedure can be technically demanding and it requires good incorporation of the graft for long-term implant instability, for long-term implant stability. And if you look at the literature, clinical results have been mixed with use of this technique. These have been mostly small retrospective studies with heterogeneous patient populations. And overall, patient, patients report good outcomes, but you can see high radiolucency rates with the implants in this setting and complications related to graft preparation, uh, fixation, and incorporation. So as a result, more recently has been the development of augmented glenoid components. And the principle with these components is the ability to maintain joint line while correcting pathologic version and minimizing excessive bone removal. And you can see a case example here of an advanced B2 glenoid that illustrates this point. You can see on the 3D CT, the typical posterior inferior wear pattern of this B2 glenoid. And on the 3D CT uh, preoperative plan, retroversion measured uh, negative 28 degrees in this case. So if we plan this particular case on the left, you can see a standard glenoid component and then on the right, an augmented component. And if we attempt to correct with both of these implants to a retroversion in more of a, nor a normal range of negative seven degrees, you can see with the standard component that this requires excessive bone removal to get full backside contact of the implant with significant joint line utilization. Whereas with the augmented component, we're able to correct pathologic version while maintaining the normal joint line and minimizing bone removal. If we try to take a standard component and minimize bone removal by leaving it in retroversion as shown here, although we're minimizing bone removal, in this case, the component is in greater than 20 degrees of retroversion, which has potential negative consequences for implant stability over time. Now, what's the evidence available so far in support of these augments? There's currently three commercially available implants. You can see in A, a posteriorly stepped component, which is made by Depew. In B is a posteriorly wedged component that's made by Exactech. And then in C is a half posterior wedge that's made by Tournier. Preclinical biomechanical and modeling studies have shown that these implants are biomechanically stable and they, that they can uh, address significant bone loss and correct uh, significant retroversion and recreate the joint line. And early clinical outcomes have been favorable with these implants. There's been three small clinical series to date with approximately two to three year clinical follow-up. And all of these studies show good outcomes with low rates of radiolucency and low complication rates. The study by Wright et al. looked at a posteriorly wedged component. And then the studies by Favorito et al. and Stevens et al. looked at posteriorly stepped components. We've recently also published our own series looking at use of a posteriorly stepped component, as you can see here. And we specifically looked at shoulders that were classified as either Walsh B2 or B3 glenoids. We identified 100 of these shoulders and 71 of these shoulders had preoperative CAT scans with minimum to your clinical follow-up. You can see this group is mostly male patients and two thirds of the cases were Walsh B2 glenoids, one third were Walsh B3. And you can see at uh, minimum to your fault, significant improvement in outcome scores as measured by the PEN score, significant improvement in pathologic uh, version, centering of the humeral head and improvement in active shoulder function. There was a 15% rate of reported central peg radiolucency or osteolysis on x-ray. And this rate is comparable to what's reported in the literature for a standard anchor peg component. And we had three reoperations in this series, none of which were related to the component. There were two early subscapularis repairs for subscap failure and one diagnostic arthroscopy for a painful shoulder that uh, was used to evaluate for occult infection. But we also tried to evaluate factors that were potentially predictive of a negative outcome with this implant. And you can see here when looking at those patients that had a postoperative pen score of less than 80, 
they were found to have significantly higher preoperative retroversion and preoperative posterior subluxation of the humeral head on their preoperative CAT scan when compared to the other cases. And then when we look specifically at those cases that develop central peg radiolucency or osteolysis, they were found to have significantly worse preoperative bone loss measured both centrally as central joint line mutilization and also as the maximum extent of posterior bone loss. And this was also measured on CAT. So we've identified some potentially negative predictors of use of an augmented component as pathology gets more severe. And if we go back to this case example I highlighted, you can see that these measurements in this particular case put it potentially near the uh, extreme end of use of an augmented component. You can see in this case, preoperative retroversion again measured negative 28 degrees, posterior glenoid bone loss measured six millimeters, and posterior subluxation of the humeral head relative to the scapula measured 85%. And you can see I planned this case for use of an augmented component. First, this video is showing use of a stepped augmented component. I'm planning to correct to seven degrees of retroversion here. And this is showing a five millimeter augmented component, which is the middle size augment with this particular implant. And you can see when we place this on the preoperative plan, I've got good backside seating here, but there is still significant joint line mealization relative to the paleoglenoid with this five millimeter augment and also even some evidence of peg perforation. So I'm gonna increase the size of this augment to a seven millimeter step, which you can see here. This is the largest augment with this system, and this allows the joint line to be lateralized better, where the joint line now better matches the preserved paleoglenoid. And we've got good back backside contact with the implant still, but again, some peg perforation posteriorly is shown there. We look on the 3D uh, view of the preoperative plan, you can see the implant position here with good backside contact, but again, this small peg perforation. Now we can also plan the same case using a wedged augment. You can see here, this is the posterior half wedge in the same case with a similar correction to negative six degrees of retroversion. Again, you can see good backside contact with this implant, but you can see with this posterior wedge, we're able to get correction with a little bit less bone removal and also a little bit better joint line mealization. And when we go to the 3D view, you can again see good backside contact, but no evidence of peg perforation with this implant. So you can see how different shaped augmented implants can fit different defects in different ways on these preoperative plans. And side to side, you can see that both of these implants provide good corrections, but with less bone removal and a little bit better restoration of joint line with the posteriorly wedged augmented component. So you can see the benefit of preoperative planning when trying to plan how to best put these augmented components in prior to surgery. It's also now been shown clinically that with preoperative planning, this leads to better, out, uh, better placement at the time of surgery. We've looked at two prospective series of patients in which we've evaluated preoperative planning and PSI in placement of the component at the time of surgery and compared these cases to historical controls that had no preoperative planning and no PSI and have shown that preoperative planning with or without PSI leads to more accurate component placement at the time of surgery. So in conclusion, there are multiple options available to address glenoid bone loss based on the severity of bone loss that's present. For mild bone loss, we can use standard eccentric reaming with standard glenoid components. But as we move into more moderate or severe bone loss, we now have augmented glenoid components available with anatomic arthroplasty. And as bone loss progresses to a more severe extent, we routinely use reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. If we look at the data to date on anatomic augmented glenoid components, there's promising clinical results, but I think preoperative planning is very important when placing these components in order to determine the best implant size position and as I illustrated, the best shaped implant for the defect that's present. And I've shown with our own clinical data that there may be limits to the pathology that can be corrected with these augmented components. And as you progress into more advanced B2 and B3 glenoids, if glenoid retroversion, bone loss, and humeral head subluxation becomes severe enough, reverse total shoulder arthroplasty may become a more reliable option. So thank you. Okay, we can continue with uh, you, Lionel. Are you ready?
Then we have some time for questions at the end. You have your microphone, you have to activate your microphone, Janelle, please. And you, Eric, you have to stop sharing your screen. I'm okay now? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, so thank you, Luciano, and thank you, everybody, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here with uh, this difficult uh, period of time. And uh, so, oh. Okay, I have a little problem. Oh yeah, do you have my presentation now? Yeah, yeah, we have it there. Okay, thank you. So my task today is to speak about managing the glenoid bone loss in glenohumeral osteoarthritis and when to use a total reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So, These are my disclosures. So uh, let's, let's, let's discuss about what the rationale for reverse use in uh, glenohumeral osteoarthritis, because we know that the treatment of reference, as uh, Rick just said, is total shoulder arthroplasty. However, um, in, some, in some of the cases, you have to face with two main challenges. The first one is that you, you, you must need, you need to have enough bone support uh, for your implant, especially on the glenoid side, and uh, that support is very important for the future of the, of the prosthesis. The second challenge is the relative position of the humerus and the glenoid together, but both into the actual plane and coronal plane. So in order to anticipate a good result for total shoulder arthroplasty, the centered uh, humerus in front of the glenoid is, um, is required. And when the, both challenges are linked, are uh, working together, the situation is even worse for the surgeon to deal with. So we have basically, as Rick shown, two different uh, situations. The, the glenoid bone loss in the actual plane is mainly encountered in, uh, in the vast classification with V2 and V3s. But also, uh, uh, and so in that, in that situation, you have to, to, to deal with, the, with both challenges. First, the glenoid bone loss in the back here but also what is very important to us is the posterior subluxation of the humeral head relative to the scapular plane. Also, in another situation, you have to deal with, with uh, defect of the glenoid on the coronal plane, as you can see here, and which we're gonna uh, first uh, talk about. Because in this situation, you have to also face with glenoid uh, bone loss, mainly on the super aspect, but also this um, uh, subluxation, uh, but cranial migration of the, of the human head due to the massive curve tear. So that situation scenario here with curve tear property with the well-known FAVA classification, we will have some E2 and E3s glenoid with osteoarthritis and glenoid bone loss altogether with a decentering effect of the, of the disease. So in that situation, we know that curve tear property patient will have super inclination much more than other etiologies for osteoarthritis. And the comparative studies have definitely uh, shown this, that uh, in curve tear property, the super inclination because of the wear of the bone mainly uh, is, uh, is, is, is more than anywhere else. And even more, if you go to E3 or E2 or even E2 glenoids, you will have an increased super inclination, uh, which is uh, more and more difficult to, to treat. So the deformity, you, you need to, to, very, to, to know it very well, because when you are in the OR, only what you see is that part of the, of the moon, and you don't see exactly what's going on behind, and you don't know in, in, the, in the operative room how that glenoid bony surface that you are facing and we, you don't know the way it is orientated. So you have an obvious lack of intraoperative landmarks to drive you and, and make you uh, implant the, 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 the implants in the good position. Because in that situation, you are in very high risk of 
super tilting your implant, which we know is not good. Here is a typical example that it's a case of Gilles back in the late 90s, where the superior inclination was not really uh, well diagnosed, and this ended up with a, a super tilt of, of the component uh, here postoperatively. And you can see here the super tilt. But unfortunately, we know that this situation is not very favorable because of the shear forces that are going to act on that imprint and that can ultimately end up with uh, migration and uh, loosening of that, of that imprint. So that early experience in the late 90s was later confirmed with other studies, all of them showing that superglenoid erosion is at risk for super tilt of the base plate and, then, and, and the sphere. And that careful consideration of this preoperative pre deformity uh, is required because the super tilt should be strictly avoided uh, because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, a risk factor for early loosening. So identification of the deformity, would it be with a simple x-ray but more uh, precisely done with a CT and as uh, we said with planification software you must identify this problem before the surgery because otherwise you, can, you, you, you may be in trouble with dealing, it, with, dealing with it and, uh, and, and with your uh, implant positioning. Once the problem is identified, you can, you can make a planification more and more precisely with the 3D planification softwares, just like you can see here with the, the surrogate of an asymmetric bone grafting technique to compensate for the superior erosion, that E3 glenoid on that case. And you can also implant uh, on the software, the bone graft on your implant uh, as a definitive uh, a scenario uh, on your computer. Or you can have a different strategy using metallic augments, but my preferred, preferred uh, technique is the, to use the asymmetric bone grafting technique. So at the end of the day, if you want to uh, achieve what you have planned into the OR, you need to have uh, additional landmark. And that landmark is the use of PSI guides that you can uh, design on the computer itself. And then that design here will be helpful to implant the centering guide to, centering, to center correctly the, 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 the actual pin for implant uh, positioning. And with this, you may uh, use it, so you use it during uh, uh, your operation, and subsequently you can increase the uh, precision and uh, the, the good positioning of your definitive implant. So basically the strategy is IPC, I for identification, P for planification, and C for correction with the right tools uh, before and during the OR. So the second scenario is the glenoid bone loss in the actual plane, and we go back to uh, more, uh, um, we, get, we get close to uh, Rick's uh, presentation. So in primary osteoarthritis, we have that situation of uh, valge B2 and B3s uh, with the posterior subluxation altogether and the glenoid erosion. So again, this series of GIL of 92 cases shown that uh, it ended up with 20% rate of glenoid loosening. And why did this occur? Because the correction that was made in the OR was quite good with, you can see here, posterior bone grafting technique and use of, un, uh, of uh, standard, standard glenoid component. Uh, but unfortunately, what was observed here, is, so uh, in that series, different uh, types of uh, glenoid implants were used. Some were spool cemented and some were middle back glenoids. But the most important information on that picture here is that the problem is that whatever the good correction that you make of the glenoid side with the bone grafting technique and fixation of your glenoid component, the problem is that over time, and you see that it's a seven to seven months per period, you have a recurrence in some of the cases, you have a recurrence of the posterior displacement of the head. So again, whatever the correction, how great you did it, but that correction, that subluxation recurs over time. You can see here the wear pattern here with the posteriorly worn polyethylene uh, component, even down to the base plate, to the metallic base plate with the wear of the, of the imprint right in the back here. So there was in that study a statistical correlation between first 
recurrence of posterior subluxation when the preoperative subluxation on CT measurements was starting from 80% and beyond. And second, the risk of glenoid loosening was high when the preoperative retroversion was also uh, uh, high. So the main problem to us seems to be the recurrence of that posterior subluxation. And one of the conclusion of that paper was that in severe forms of B2, so it's the combination of the big bone loss and a higher amount of posterior subluxation, these, these patients were not adequately treated by using a, a total shoulder arthroplasty. At that time, it was a, uh, a standard non-augmented non, uh, component. But however, the hypothesis was made to, that these patients would be more efficiently treated by using the reverse. And this is the second series, it's a shorter uh, number of cases series, but and shorter follow-up, but still 54 months. And you can see here, great amount of uh, subluxation with significant bone loss that were at that time treated with the reverse in, main, in most of the cases with the bone grafting technique, which is good because you have here an uncemented option here with compression screws that will enhance the chance for the bone graft to heal. And one of the, of the, of the main uh, results, apart from the, the functional and, uh, and uh, range of motion results, was that there was no recurrence of the posterior subluxation thanks to the semi-constrained strain design of the reverse. And that was giving a, a good solution for these patients with highly uh, posteriorly subluxated heads in B2 and B3s. And if we made the comparison with the, the new kids on the block, which is the, what Rick mentioned with the new augmented genoids on that wonderful series uh, from, the, from the Cleveland uh, team with 71 shoulders being B, B, B2 and B3s, uh, there was definitely at that time a follow-up around 2.4 years, a, a great and significant improvement in genoid version correction and also in functional results. However, and at the end of the day, we end up with the same discussion because as Rich shown, you have this kind of what we call a B2 light, a light B2, which is a, a mild a glenoid deformity with the glenoid bolt model and the correction with the step and with the augmented implants, you will have a very nice reconstruction and centered head. However, if you deal with more severe, the severe B2s or, B, or even B3s, you will see that progressively over time recurrence of the posterior subluxation. So again, even if it's more accurately corrected here with the augmented implant, with less joint line medialization effect, with less bone removal because of the shape and the position of the implant, the problem is that over time you will have a recurrence of the posterior subluxation, which we think is, is the, 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 the main problem and the main issue. So the conclusion of the paper, interestingly, were quite the same from the Gilles paper because it was stated that more severe glenoid bone loss cases with more preoperative glenoid retroversion and more head uh, subluxation may not be correctly addressed with these implants and would be better addressed with reverse arthroplasty. Unfortunately, they were not able to determine the amount where the limits were to choose between the augmented implants and before the switch with the reverse. So in fact, what do we learn? We know that we have different situations between mild or uh, more, more uh, severe uh, deformities. But at the end of the day, not all the B2s will have glenoid loosening and recurrence of the posterior subluxation. So of course, not all the B2s need a reverse uh, correction. So we know we, what, so the job of, of, uh, of, the, of the different teams now is to, uh, to test where the limit is and to try to find it. But uh, today we don't really know. What is most important? The retroversion, is it 20, is it 30, is it 40? We don't know it. Is it more important to take care of subluxation, preoperative humor head subluxation? Is it 70? Is it 80? Is it 90% relative to the plan of the, of the scapular body? We don't know. 
So on, the only thing I can tell you, tell you tonight is what, what we do. And we have this kind of threshold, which means that for preoperative, less than 80% of humoral head subluxation in primary glenohumeral osteoarthritis, we go for total shoulder arthroplasty, provided that with the preoperative planning with either a standard or a, an augmented component, we can achieve at least um, uh, less than 10 degrees of retroversion. On the opposite, if we have more than 90% of human health subluxation preoperatively, we don't even try these options and we go straight to the, uh, right to the reverse. In between, between preoperative 80 to 90% of human health head subluxation, you see this is the primary criteria we use. Uh, we have like a gray zone. And here you can play with the boundaries. You can, you can explore the boundaries of the, of the galaxy and see and try to test the hypothesis of the augmented component, which we basically do, but we, we still have to work on this, uh, like uh, Rick mentioned, and, uh, and we still have to uh, determine where is the limit and when we can safely, for the patient, use and, and, and stay with total shoulder arthroplasty uh, with augmented component, actually, or when we should uh, strictly uh, move to the reverse. So in conclusion, we go back to the IPC strategy. Very important to identify the glenoid bone loss deformity, to take into account the position of the, of the glenoid and the humerus all together, and in the actual plane, to, to, to really um, uh, be um, cautious with the subluxation uh, in the back, and when you deal with Kerstia uh, arthropathy, deal with the superinclination and the amount of uh, inclination and super migration. P for planification, uh, preferably now with the 3D preoperative planning. And lastly, C for correction, best in our hands with asymmetric bone grafting technique, here with the reverse to correct the posterior uh, erosion and with the simulated screen device to correct the posterior subluxation, or here to correct the superior inclination excessive and uh, allow not for uh, super migration thanks to the reverse design. I thank you. Okay, perfect, Lionel. Thank you very much. Really two very interesting uh, presentations. Um, Gishe, I don't know, we have some questions from the audience. Hi, good afternoon. Yes, we have a question uh, for Dr. Niton from Karen Bilsell. He's asking if you sometimes do a preoperative uh, planning for a large glenoid bone defects to do it in a two-stage uh, treatment instead of one only. Yeah, that's that's a very good question, and it's it is another it is another limit we, we we don't know because we know that we have the possibility with the bone grafting technique or even with metallic augments. But let's speak about bone grafting technique in in and the discussion between one and two stages. Uh, we still have to 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 measure and learn when the 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 primary fixation of the bo of the bone graft or together with the base plate. We still have to, to, to understand better where is the limit between uh, uh, um, enough primary fixation on which you can rely on and immediately uh, implant the humoral side with the constraint that you will have on it on the glenoid side and therefore being able to perform a one stage procedure. But we know that in, in, in the most severe cases, the, the, the primary stability of the construct, whatever screw base plate or long post base plate you use, sometimes it's going to be too much for the primary stability and for the construct to be um, loaded right after the, 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 the reconstruction. And maybe, and probably in these cases, very severe cases when you have almost no glenoid left preoperatively, you may consider to do a, a two stage cases. I must admit that over time and over experience, we can push a little bit the limits and it's now very rare 
that we have to do two stages procedure in, in this situation. But however, in very severe cases, we can uh, go for one stage reconstruction, what we can call the hemi reverse, because you can do your bone grafting technique, implant the base plate, implant the spear, and prepare the humerus, the humeral side, without the implant, and match the two together. And this is like a hemi reverse, and consider. Uh, how the patient is evolving over time, and then consider for the second step. Okay, thank you. Dr. Marignon is asking uh, if we, uh, for it's a question for all of you. If you don't have uh, a 3D preoperative uh, CT available, which is your recommendation? Well, I can say, I mean, if you're considering using an augmented component like I demonstrated, ideally you have preoperative planning. Um, but I think if you're missing that, I think a great case to uh, use it on for the first time particularly is just a classic B2 glenoid with that classic uh, midpoint erosion where you have a very well-defined paleoglenoid that you, you can use as your target intraoperatively to position your implant relative to, because that's really your target even on preoperative planning. So as you get into more advanced bone loss and lose the paleoglenoid, it can be more challenging to plan or know how to put an augmented component in without preoperative planning. But I think a classic B2, because of the paleoglenoid, allows you to still uh, match the defect well and plan your position well, whether it's with a stepped component or a posteriorly uh, wedged component. Okay, thank you. No more questions. Uh, I, I have a qu uh, last question for both of you. Uh, I saw in your presentations that you, you are using shorter stems. Uh, what do you think about stemless prosthesis? Do you think that's the future or uh, you don't like them? What's your opinion? I may, I may start. Uh, sure. I would say that I, I've been using over the last months some cases of uh, anatomic replacement uh, stemless implants. Uh, on, on the on the anatomical side, I don't I don't think it makes a, a, a significant difference. Um, uh, the the difference for me is the is the technique for reattachment of the subcapillaries because I'm I'm using a, a mixed technique of transfer sutures going into my uh, into the shaft and mixed all together with a tendon to tendon uh, suture. So when there is no hole in the shaft, you have to modify a little bit that technique, but whatever, the, 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 these patients didn't have any issue with my repair of the steps cap and they have at the three months post stop control that I did last week. In three cases, they have, they have a, good, uh, a, a good repair of the steps cap that is still there. So on, on, the, on the anatomical side, I don't see any issue using the stemless. Uh, on the reverse side, uh, it might be a little bit different because we know that the loads that are going to be uh, applied on the humeral side uh, are, are completely different. So there is, there is, there is certainty that uh, some implants and uh, the, the Lima uh, stemless reverse is out there, and uh, but I I didn't see so far uh, mid to long term results uh, in the literature. But however, uh, I have some friends who are using that implant with uh, with no with no no difficulty, and uh, so I would say why not? But nowadays, I mean today, I will still use a stem for reverse, and. On the other side, on the anatomy, I don't think it made any difference. I agree with Leon. I, I think I agree with all his points. Stemless has been less available in the U.S. compared to Europe, but it's becoming more and more common in the U.S. And I think more and more people will use it. But I think like any stem, it's getting used to the technique of putting it in. To put in a well anatomically reconstructed stemless you have to know the tricks just the same way you have to know tricks for putting in a short stem or a long stem well. So it, there's a learning curve, I think, with any of them, but it's a bone preserving operation. And I agree, there is some modification to the 
subscapularis repair technique, I perform a lesser tuber osteosteotomy, and you can still do that with a stemless implant, but there is a little bit of a modification of the repair technique. And I also have a little bit of concern about stemless and a reverse implant. Uh, they're not currently available in the U.S., but I would be more concerned about the stresses. Thank um, you. If, 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 I, if I can make an ad about the stemless, uh, we've been using in Europe, not me, but uh, some of the fellows out here, the, the test, the test which is like a, a reverse spider. And one of the issues uh, that were um, seen over the cases is the high variability of the neck shaft angle. So if you, if you consider that neck shaft angle today is very important, especially for motion, for stability, for, and for a glenoid notching, uh, reducing rate, reducing rate. Uh, if you consider that more various position is what you, where you want to go to reduce the notching rate, you want to rely on an implant that will reproducibly give you that, that inclination. But if you use the reverse today, we know that the variability of the neck shaft angle that you have at the end of the day on your x-ray control x-rays is not reproducible today. So it is another point, let's say against reverse stemless, but there is no doubt that jigs and, and, and tips and tricks and uh, surgeon skills will, will, uh, will do something positive for that. Perfect. That's a good point. Mark, do you have some questions? Yes, I have a couple of questions. First, for Eric. Eric, let's suppose you can manage the defect, the, the, the glenoid defect, and you can put your glenoid component where you want. Do you find any particular case where you can choose a reverse prosthesis, for example, in older people, comorbidities? I don't know. When do you choose a reverse, even if you can manage your glenoid defect? Yeah, that's a good question because there's where you can put the implant within the bony deformity from the preoperative plan, but then the soft tissues are just as important as making that decision. And you can see in older patients, and we have a study recently published on that, that as you get more advanced deformity with B, particularly B3 glenoids, you can also potentially get more associated rotator cuff, either atrophy or fatty infiltration that potentially impacts your soft tissue stability. And just with patient age, get rotator cuff degeneration that impacts that. So I definitely take into account patient age. And if I have an augmented, if I have a B2 glenoid that is well, um, Fit for an augmented component in a 55-year-old, I may not choose to do that in a 75-year-old whose cuff is of questionable uh, integrity. So I definitely err on reverse implants as patients get older, particularly over 70 years of age. And I think a lot of people are doing that now, even with the augmented components. I think the other, you know, part of the decision to do an augmented ver versus a reverse component, an augmented component is a more technically challenging operation. So I think there is a learning curve to being able to do it and get comfortable doing it. A reverse implant can be done, I think, with a little less technical difficulty. So it can be another reason to err on reverse as pathology gets more severe. Yeah, hopefully this is a discussion that we can uh, do now with the cases that I'm about to present. So yeah, definitely. A good start, it's a good start. Okay. Well, uh, Thank you, Attorney Don and Attorney Getty, for, the, uh, for those good presentations. I'm going to switch to Spanish now. <laughs> but I will be asking the questions in English. Let me see. Share. Okay. Can everyone see it? Yep. yep. Okay. So, I'm going to talk about a presentar ciertos casos para ver este si podemos este ver 
¿no? ejemplos de esos conceptos que el Dr. Riquetti y el Dr. Nathan nos presentaron. Este, a ver si podemos este, crear un poquito de discusión, ¿no? Eh, vamos a empezar primero con un paciente de 66 años o dominante de la mano derecha con, que vino con dos años de dolor en el hombro izquierdo. Eh, ha tenido dos inyecciones de corticosteroides que no le habían ayudado, pero el médico pasado de hipertensión. Este, en el examen físico, eh, el movimiento tenía 100 grados activos de elevación, 50 grados de rotación externa y rotación interna llegaba a los niveles lumbares bajos. Este, el mango rotador en cuanto a fuerza estaba intacto, no tenía este, lag signs y el belly press estaba negativo. Así que el mango rotador parece estar intacto. Los rayos X iniciales cuando se presenta, este, tenemos AP y lateral en la... En la AP podemos ver que hay medialización del, de la coyuntura del hombro, con el, como puede ver que la tuberosidad mayor está medial al borde lateral del acromio. Este, hay pérdida de, de la coyuntura por completo. En la axilar podemos ver que hay falta eh, de hueso, particularmente posterior, con descentralización, particularmente posterior de la cabeza del húmero. Este, yo diría que eso es alrededor de, no sé, 75% según el plano de la escápula. Este, en cuanto a, so Dr. Riquetti and Dr. Nathan, uh, is this a case, I mean, based on your, on your presentations, both of you would get a CT, a pre-op on this case? Uh, yeah, I would. I think you can see if you go back to the x-rays, um, I think there's concern for bone loss in this case. You can see the lateral cortex of the humerus looks medialized relative to the acromion, so you'd be yeah. concerned about significant bone loss. And the axillary view suggests some posterior subluxation as well, and you could evaluate those things better, I think, on a preoperative CAT scan. Agreed. Uh, Matsi, eh, ¿ustedes le hacen tomografía a todos los pacientes preoperatorios? Sí, a, a las artrosis les hacemos tomografía a casi todas las que sospechamos que tienen un defecto óseo. Si la artrosis es muy leve, no, pero si no, sí, le hacemos un, un 3D. Listo. Bueno, pues esta es la tomografía del paciente. Este, en el plano axial eh, podemos ver que hay falta eh, ósea posterior en la glena, este, particularmente en esta área, y podemos ver que está el paleogleno. El neogleno, el, neo, el neogleno y este, en la coronal, como ver que hay medialización, volvemos y falta eh, de hueso central, este, con lo que bueno, los teofitos de, de la cabeza del húmero inferior eh, son tradicionales. ¿no? En, la, en, en la reconstrucción tridimensional, este, vemos que hay 27 grados de retroversión en la deformidad, con un grado de inclinación superior. Este, el doctor Riquetti introdujo el concepto de, del glenoid vault, ¿no? Este, y basado en ese concepto eh, y en la planificación preoperatoria de nosotros, entendemos que la, la versión y la inclinación este, premórbida de este paciente es de 7 grados de retroversión y 6 grados de inclinación superior. Es consistente ¿no? con la artrosis primaria de húmero, que es este, falla posterior inferior, ¿no? Es falta posterior inferior de hueso. La coronal, volvemos lo mismo, aquí vemos también el, el, el modelo ¿no? del glenoid volt y la inclinación que medía así, de un grado. Aquí es la reconstrucción tridimensional, que volvemos los mismos este, ángulos, este, podemos ver ahí, lo que ven ahí en anaranjado es ese modelo del glenoid volt y como pueden ver, este, ahí, ahí te deja ver que la falta es postre inferior, este, porque se está, está expuesto ¿no? el, el modelo uh, en la reconstrucción. Entonces, eh, Dr. Riquetti y Dr. Nathan, uh, what would you classify this glenoid as in the watch classification? Uh, can you go back a little bit on, on the CT? Yeah. Okay, so uh, can you go on, on the CT? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
So just for the fun, we could say that it could be a little bit, little, little remaining paleoglinoid in the very anterior aspect, but uh, it could be also an osteopathic part. So, but regarding the shape and considering that what we see on the very front uh, is an osteophyte, I would, uh, I would say it's a B3. Because yeah, I, I could, this yeah, this point, yeah. right, exactly. So I don't consider this as being a paleo glenoid, uh, just an osteophyte. And uh, so we have joint line medialization and uh, complete posterior, uh, com complete glenoid uh, posterior orientation. And uh, it looks to me that it's a B3. Yeah, I agree. And if you go back a slide, Jose, you know, the, the axials on the axial yeah. CT, yeah. yeah. You know, the, the amount of central wear with the retroversion makes this a B3 for me on top of what's already been said, where there's really not a paleoglenoid. So I agree. Yeah, same here. Okay. So. So we try uh, to preoperate, uh, perdón, hablar en español. Eh, vamos, tratamos de, de planificar preoperatoriamente todos los casos con reconstrucciones tridimensionales. En un paciente de 66 años con, con el mango rotador intacto, tratamos siempre de, 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 de ver cómo se ve el reemplazo anatómico. En este caso empezamos con el, con el de Depew, que es el step tech, y en la planificación pusimos un, un aumento de 5 milímetros posterior. Eh, con, a 10 grados de retroversión, so, eh, corregiendo 17 grados. Eh, y como podemos ver, eh, perdemos un poquito de hueso en la parte central, ¿no? por, por el step. También estamos todavía bastante medializados en nuestra línea de la coyuntura, en comparación con el, con el modelo del Glenoid Vault. Eh, Aquí se ve en la reconstrucción tridimensional y podemos ver también que los, los postes superior y el posterior inferior también eh, penetran eh, por, la, por la escápula. Doctor, requeriendo doctor Nitton, uh, you, you, you could have seen in the 3D recon that there was posterior uh, pec perforation as well as superior pec perforation. Uh, does that have any clinical importance or the pre-op plan for you as far as deciding which implant uh, are you using? I mean, I, I personally get worried about multiple pegs perforating. If you have mild perforation of one peg, I think that is less concerning to me, but multiple pegs perforating are worrisome. Um, for a case like this, my reasoning for using an augmented component is the ability to restore the joint line. So you can see in a case like this, when there's such central bone loss, that even when using the augmented component, you're still very medialized. For me, that's a reason to move away from an augment and move to a reverse because you're not able to achieve the goal of what that implant is supposed to do. So this has multiple concerning findings for being able to put a standard component in the amount of uh, medialization and central bone loss and then the multi-peg uh, perforation. I'm going to give you a secret. I have never any peg perforation because I'm using a keel. Ah, good point. <laughs> I didn't get that. Could you try again? Okay. Uh, so, because of the morphology and because of what, uh, pelo, so, uh, porque por la morfología del, del defecto, ¿no? Y por lo que el doctor Riquete estaba mencionando, ¿no? De que los, eh, los postes estaban perforando y que no estábamos este, corrigiendo la, la medialización de la coyuntura. Eh, nosotros tratamos también de el, el implante de exacte, que es una cuña completa, ¿eh? Este, no es un step como el de, como el de, de Pew, que quizás este, tiene mejor conformidad a la deformidad que tiene esta glena. Y queríamos ver cómo se veía. So, esto es una cuña completa con, con un aumento de 16 grados posterior. Eh, como pueden ver, ninguno de los postes está perforando y entendemos que lo, estamos corrigiendo la retroversión a 10 grados y este tipo de implante pues vuelve la línea de la coyuntura a, a algo más cerca que lo del modelo del Glenoid Box que este, predice que era premorbido, ¿no? 
También este, aquí vemos la coronal, eh, que hay eh, buen eh, asentamiento del, del componente. Y esta es la reconstrucción tridimensional, que ven que ninguno de los postes está perforando. También, este, por esa por ese, bueno, preocupación de que los postes estuvieran perforando y quizá no pudiéramos corregirlo como queríamos, también planificamos este, una reversa. Y esto es el implante de DJO. Este, nosotros cuando ponemos una reversa con este implante, eh, tratamos de... No buscamos a que el implante esté 100% eh, en contacto con el hueso. Hay estudios de Dr. Frankel que hablan de que con 50% eh, contacto posterior con este implante, hay, no hay micromoción suficiente para que el implante eh, se suelte, eso es estable suficiente. Nosotros tratamos de que llegue a 50% para entonces no medializar tanto, aunque sigue siendo una reversa, pero no nos gusta medializar tanto. Y este, como pueden ver, entonces planificamos para ponerle un injerto eh, de hueso posterior que mediría alrededor de 6 milímetros este, y corregiría a 6 grados de retroversión. Pero esta este es la reconstrucción tridimensional, como pueden ver ahí, este, ese sería el, el, el injerto ¿no? que pusiéramos, que usaríamos de la cabeza del humano. Entonces, eh, Dr. Ricker y Dr. Nitton y Matsy, ¿qué implant would you use? Would you go with a reverse, uh, reverse with a bone graft? Would you do by RSA? Would you do an augment? What's your leaning on this case? So, uh, as we saw in your uh, preoperative planning tool, uh, I, I, I just uh, checked it, but it, it was not uh, measured. But the uh, human health subluxation was uh, was pretty high, according to me on that on that case. Yeah, it was like eighty something. Yeah, I didn't see it, but oh, all these are the same case. It's the same case from the beginning. Yeah. Oh, it's strange because on the on the CT, the the subluxation doesn't look that big, but here it looks bigger. Yeah. Okay. So again, uh, we I, I don't know if it's a, a matter if it's a disagreement or if it's uh, uh, the the fact that we uh, here take much more into account or give more importance to the human head subluxation uh, problem, more than the amount of correction of the version of the glenoid wear. I mean, uh, I the it's correlated most of the time, but not 100%. So yes, in that case, uh, even though the patient is 66, and uh, you could say it's a little bit too young for the reverse, I think that Regarding the 80% or so uh, posterior, um, yeah, posterior subluxation combined with the, the glenoid wear uh, in the posterior aspect, I would probably, it would certainly go to a reverse in that, in that patient. Okay. I think Dr. Riccardi, you would lean that way as well, I'm guessing. Yeah, I was, you know, as I said before, this case worries me for the amount of central bone loss um that i would all and the how small the glenoid vault has become for fixation that i would also put a reverse in this case i think in terms of the posterior subluxation i i i i think about it as well as being very important too i think you can you know think about it as well with regards to the joint line mealization when you have this much central joint line mealization it's hard to have appropriate soft tissue balance with an anatomic implant And if you remain medialized, I think you get into the situation that Leonel was talking about of where you're at risk for post-operative, posterior subluxation because of that persistent medialization. So I agree that's a big concern in this case. I think the other thing that's interesting about these very advanced B3 glenoids, many of these cases intraoperatively have inflammatory changes to them. They look like inflammatory arthritis in many cases that I think relates to that central wear. So when you have potentially those intraoperative changes of, that are inflammatory, it's another reason if something like that's present. I don't know if it was in this case, but you often see that in these advanced B3 glenoids that 
make you lean towards reverse as well. So I, I would put a reverse in as well. Okay, sounds good. So let's see what we did. Vamos a ver lo que hicimos. Uh, also, uh, would you would you use? Is this a case that you would use a patient specific guide? Uh, any of you? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I must say that the use of the PSI guide has, has become my my routine practice, even in the easy, easy cases. I, I have had the discussion many times with with other fellows, and there is there is a trend to consider that the use of the PSI should be done only in difficult cases. I don't agree with that. Because if you are not used to use the PSI in easy cases, and you start to use a, a, a new technique for you as a surgeon in a difficult case, you are in double trouble. Because you're gonna have to deal with a difficult case and you're gonna rely on something you are not used to use. So this is not a good idea. So we can consider that using the PSI technique is overuse of it and probably uh, economically uh, a problem. I, I can absolutely agree with that. But I, on the other side, I don't agree with the, the concept of using it only in difficult cases because of what I just explained. What about you, Dr. Rigetti? I know the answer to that one. I don't routinely use PSI guides because there's a significant added cost in America for using them. I think if they were not as uh, cost prohibitive currently in America, I would use them more frequently, but this is the kind of case that you would consider using it in because of the more advanced pathology. If you're not routinely using it in every case, you would think about it in a more severe case like this. I think. You know, that is one of the issues with use of it in America. The cost of it makes it not as widely used currently. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So, esto fue lo que hicimos. Este, pusimos eh, una anatómica con aumento de exacte, con la cuña de 16 grados. Este... Me pusimos una cabeza de 50 por 18 milímetros, este, que es de DJO, y usamos un stem numeral de 16 milímetros. Este, aquí podemos ver este, pues, corrección de, de la subluxación del húmero, este, descentralización de la cabeza, corrección de la, de la medialización de la coyuntura. Este, Dr. Uh, Riquetti, uh, would you predict these x-rays? Do you agree with it? I, mean, I, mean, I know you would have done a reverse, but um, what do you think? What do you think of the outcome of this? Is it certainly pushing, this is certainly pushing the limits of an outcome. I mean, I think you've got good post-operative x-rays. You can see that it's got a good AP reconstruction and it looks well centered on the AP view. Um, you can see the potential challenge in this case, though. I think if you look at this x-ray view, that central peg may have a perforation to it medially. Yeah, I agree. Um, which is the challenge when you have so much central bone loss. To hit the center of the vault and not perforate your central peg gets more challenging when there's less bone there. And so you, you wonder, you know, with that central peg perforation, is that a risk for uh, loosening in the, in the short term? I agree with that. I think in the pre-op plan, uh, it didn't, but uh, in practice, uh, that certainly there's perforation of the central peg. Anything else from you, Dr. Ito? That's okay. We, we, we can see that uh, the compensation for the medialization of the joint line was uh, done through using the probably the, mo the thickest uh, implant. Correct. Uh, because it's, uh, it's, for me, it's a large amount of polyethylene to the joint. However, it was required by the medialization, and uh, that's what we needed. So, but by, by the way, uh, the the contact, the backside contact that we can see is good. Yeah, it's of, really good. Of, of course, the the central peg is uh, is perforating, but uh, anyway, the contact is good. Yeah, I agree. We'll see. I mean, this is, this is certainly pushing the limits. It's interesting to see how this patient does, you know, at the five seven year interval. You know? 
Ok, on to the next case. El próximo caso. Oh, I, this is something I wanted to ask you guys. Uh, does glenoid, I think Dr. Riquetti mentioned this in his uh, talk, does glenoid morphology in a, in a posterior bonus case that you're thinking of anatomic, does glenoid morphology affect which type of augment you use? As far as tap, half wedge, or full wedge? Or do you use, tend to use the same implant all the time? Yeah, I, I must admit, as, as Eric mentioned in his talk and in the discussion, uh, using an augment implant is quite challenging, especially if you don't have the, the preoperative planning and uh, the PSI for me. So I, I don't want to play with different uh, tools and I am always using the same. Uh, and so this doesn't really affect it, it, the, the glenoid morphology again and the subluxation is going to influence me whether I use a reverse with bone grafting technique, actually, not metallic augment at this stage. But uh, it's going to influence me between the, the choice between the reverse and, and, the, and the total, but not in, the, not in the shape of the augment I will consider. For me, I mean, I've used mostly the posterior step component that Depew makes, but I've uh, been using more and more the posterior half wedge made by Tournier. So I've got good experience with both implants. And you can see that the implants fit a little differently. The, the step component really fits best in a B2 glenoid where the paleo is at least 50% of the surface. As you get into a smaller and smaller paleo glenoid, it's more and more difficult to fit the step component as well. Uh, and the posture wedge, I think, fits better in those scenarios. Um, but I agree, it, you have to have a comfort level with the implant you're using. Um, and as you get less and less of that paleo glenoid, I agree that moves you closer and closer to putting a reverse uh, total shoulder arthroplasty in. And, you know, we still don't have long-term data. If you look biomechanically, the posteriorly stepped component is the most biomechanically stable, but the posterior wedge takes away less bone and is, is more straightforward to put in at the time of surgery. So we don't really know clinically which one actually is more durable long-term at this point. José, una, una cosa interesante es que la, la línea articular medializada no es buena para, para una prótesis total. Volví. Pero, ahí estás. Ahí volví, 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 perdón. No, no es bueno que te quede medializada la interlínea articular en una prótesis total de hombro, pero tampoco es bueno que te quede medializada la glenoesfera cuando vos haces una prótesis reversa. Lo ideal sería eh, también lateralizar la glenoesfera, ya sea con hueso como hacen en Francia, nosotros preferimos lateralizarlo con la glenoesfera más 3 o más 6, de acuerdo al, al sitting que tengamos de la glenoesfera, ¿no? Pero tampoco es gratis tener la glenoesfera medializada en la reversa porque la torna más inestable. Sí, yo estoy de acuerdo, nosotros tratamos de hacer lo mismo. Okay. Sigo. Dale nomás. Bueno, este es el próximo caso. Este, este es un paciente de 39 años, un poco más joven que el último, este, dominante la mano derecha, eh, con dolor en el brazo, en el hombro izquierdo. Ha tenido un historial de inestabilidad eh, bastante extenso. Jugaba fútbol americano en División 1, en colegial. Este, y tuvo varios procedimientos. Tuvo un procedimiento artroscópico de estabilización en el 99, después tuvo uno abierto de estabilización en el 2000, después tuvo un debridado artroscópico en el 2002. Eh, todavía tiene dolor, eh, falta de función, ha tenido varios cursos de terapia física, inyecciones, este, pero todavía no, no mejora su, su dolor y su función. En el examen físico tiene eh, incisiones eh, sin sin signos de infección, están este, sanas, sin problemas, no hay ninguna atrofia de, de los músculos periescapulares. Eh, en cuanto a movimiento, tiene movimiento activo y pasivo a 90 grados en elevación, rotación externa a 0 grados, muy limitada, y rotación interna a los niveles lumbares bajos, 
en cuanto a su examen el mango rotador en fuerza está todo intacto eh, el subscapular es con el belly press parece estar negativo y el lag signs está negativo no problemas neurovasculares en las radiografías podemos ver este, en la P eh, vemos este signos ¿no? de artrosis de glonumeral con poquito inferior en la cabeza del húmero. Eh, también podemos ver este, que hay varias anclas de metálicas este, por sus eh, procedimientos eh, anteriores. En la axilar podemos ver que esas anclas parecen estar en la cara de la glena ¿no? y quizás son la causa de, de, esta, de esta artrosis. Eh, hay descentralización de la cabeza del húmero posterior. Eh, como pueden ver, con, con lo que parece ser este, falta de hueso en la glena posterior. Ahí como podemos ver el ancla. Entonces, en la tomografía eh, podemos ver, eh, volvemos a ver el ancla y este efecto no posterior eh, en la glena. Eh, no, consistente con, con una glena B2. Entonces, en la reconstrucción tridimensional, este, podemos medir que tiene 24 grados eh, de retroversión y tiene una inclinación de 7 grados. Cuando planificamos este caso, este, un paciente joven ¿no? de 39 años, este, queremos con el mango rotador intacto, nos gustaría poner una, un reemplazo anatómico, eh, pero tiene esa, parte, esa, falla, esa falta de hueso posterior. So, primero empezamos con este implante con un aumento de 5 milímetros posterior para corregir esa retroversión de 24 grados a 9 grados. Como podemos ver, este, podemos eh, restaurar ¿no? eh, la, la coyuntura del glenumeral. Este, tenemos que quitar quizás un poquito de hueso central, pero corrige la retroversión y restaura la la, la coyuntura, ¿no? Este, no hay perforación del, pex, del poste central. Entonces, quizás este, si tratamos de hacer esto con, una, con un componente eh, sin aumento y corregir en los mismos eh, grados, tendríamos que medializar la coyuntura, ¿no? Y quitar bastante hueso eh, de la glena y quizás ir a este hueso, eh, romper el plato subcondral y el hueso que no es, no es tan bueno para fijación, ¿no? Eh, o podemos usar una, una glena sin aumento, pero dejarlo en la retroversión y nada más corregir parcial a, a 20 grados. So, uh, Dr. Riquetti and Dr. Nitons, pretty much a young patient, 39, post capsulography uh, OA. Um, he has a P2 glenoid. In this type of case, uh, What do you prefer? Do you prefer a hemi with or without uh, resurfacing? Do you think an augment on this case is a good option uh, given his age? Uh, or would you just do a standard uh, glenoid component with eccentric green? Mm, for me, there is no way I can go for a total in a 39. Because There is 100% chance that okay. within 10... Does the, hem, does the hemi that you do is a standard hemi or with a paracarbon head? Yeah. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know I had to, to speak about the, uh, the paracarbon because no, I don't know if it's... I know it's not uh, FDA approved. Uh, so I don't know if you have the availability to, to use that, uh, that uh, material. But uh, yes, definitely in that case, I would go for a hemi with a pyrocarbon head at one point. If I can make sure that there will never ever be a contact between the metallic anchors and the pyrocarbon head. Because if it gets so, it's gonna be catastrophic. Because the, the pyrocarbon is soft compared to the, to the metal and the little piece of metal that will contact with the pyrocarbon will destroy it completely okay. and it will destroy the joint. Okay. So yes, for hemi with power carbon head, if I can make it 
with the removal of the of the the anchors. Okay, sounds good. fair enough. Oh, uh, Max, ¿qué tú qué tú piensas de este caso? ¿Qué tú harías? Es el peor escenario porque un paciente joven con esa patología, uno sabe que si le pone una prótesis, una EMI, a los dos años le está poniendo la glena. Sí. O a los cinco. Y, y no hay mucha diferencia entre 39 y 43 o 45 en cuanto a la prótesis. Y uno también sabe que cuanto más joven es el paciente, más chances tiene que se afloje la glena si le pone una total. Nosotros en Argentina hoy iríamos por una total. Ok. Usted, usted, en mi entender que ustedes todavía no tienen los, los aumentos en Argentina disponibles para ustedes, no, ¿correcto? Todavía no hay, no. Si lo tuvieran, ¿lo usaría en este caso? Mira, yo trataría de, de, de respetar cierta retroversión. Hace poco leí un artículo que cuando vos tenés hasta 15 grados de retroversión eh, podés esperar buenos resultados, así que trataría de jugar con eso. La menor cantidad de, de polietileno que pueda le pondría. Ok, vale. Doctor uh, Nathan, uh, I forgot to ask. So in in the in a part in this setting with the posterior bone loss, you put a pyrocarbon head. Would you ream the glenoid? Given given the no, I wouldn't. I, I, I'm the rim and run. No, I would. I wouldn't. Uh, I would just take care of the anterior steel pipes that we can see on the CD. Uh, probably uh, have a ranger here just to to make it. Uh, yeah, that that little spike here. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't go for rimming. Dr. Rigetti, any thoughts? Well, this is my case, so I could tell you what I did. <laughs> well, I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to show it. But no, I, you know, this is a challenging case. I mean, this is a very young patient. Um, you know, fortunately, we don't have to see this bad a pathology in young patients that, that often. Uh, we don't have pyrocarbon hemis available in the U.S. yet. So for a standard hemi, you know, based on the literature with standard hemis, I worry about clinical outcome with this amount of posterior wear and subluxation. The clinical literature would suggest that HEMIs don't do well in this scenario. So I wanted to put an anatomic implant in him and because of the amount of posterior wear, I chose to put an augmented implant. And I, I will say that I've actually, the handful of times that I've done posterior bone grafting with an augmented implant, it's been in the younger patient. Um, but it's an operation that is technically challenging, and I think the literature suggests it's not as predictable as using uh, uh, an augmented component. So I chose to do that in this situation. Okay. So, sí, esto, es, esto fue lo que hicimos, un implante anatómico con un este aumento posterior de 5 milímetros. Como pueden ver, eh, la cabeza está centralizada, hay corrección de la, de la retroversión y no hay perforación de los, de los postes. Eh, a dos años, eh, el paciente está bien, tiene elevación a 160-170 grados, rotación externa de 50-60 grados, y buena rotación interna con el mango rotador intacto y, y el subcapular también intacto. En el José, this, this patient's doing very well, but he's got a long, a long time to live with his implant, so it'll be interesting to see how long this lasts at such a young age. Jose, would you propose, would anyone do a reverse total shoulder in this situation in someone this young? I, I would avoid it myself. I thought this patient was too young for a reverse. Max, reversa en este paciente? No, no, no. consideraría? No, 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 bajo ningún un concepto. Lo que sí quería preguntarles es si para alguno de ustedes tiene lugar algún okay. tipo de injerto biológico, como hacia lata, menisco, o algo de eso que hasta hace unos años había algunos intentos en la literatura y después fracasaron. Sí, mayormente de Burkhead, nadie, pero nadie pudo, nadie pudo eh, tener esos mismos resultados que él. Eh, Luciano, ¿tenemos tiempo para otro? José, estamos casi en el tiempo, lo que sí tenemos un par de preguntas de la, del auditorio, si te parece, aprovechamos, eh, que tienen que ver con los casos y con las presentaciones, y, 
Después de las preguntas vamos cerrando. Muy buenos los casos. Claro. Interesante. Gracias, José. Seguro. Eh, Guille, vos tenés una pregunta del, del auditorio. Eh, sí, una pregunta para Maxi y es eh, ¿qué experiencia tienen eh, si usan algún tipo de guía eh, para abordar los grandes defectos eh, glenoideos? Y si hay experiencia en esto, ¿cuál es el límite si lo usan como dijo el doctor Nitón, para todos los pacientes o en casos seleccionados? Una de las cosas más difíciles que hay en, en, la, en la cirugía del hombro es el déficit de glena porque como vos no podés fijar la escápula nunca, cuando pones las palancas es muy difícil saber bien cómo está tu defecto. Una de las cosas más complejas es pasar del preoperatorio a la cirugía. Entonces, vos podés tener la tomografía, podés haber visto cómo va tu implante, pero después para hacerlo, para colocarlo, es difícil. Nosotros hacemos una guía hecha a medida para los casos que tenemos mucho déficit, sobre todo porque cuando vos pones la clavija central, después la cirugía se te, se te facilita mucho. Así que para nosotros es importante eso en los casos de mucho déficit, ¿no? ¿Y cómo la crean? ¿Qué, qué usan? O sea... Tenemos, lo hacemos es casero, digamos, tenemos una impresora 3D y con la tomografía y un programa vemos el defecto que tiene, creamos la guía, que la imprimimos 3D y después la utilizamos en, en la colocación del paciente. De acuerdo a cómo es el defecto, la guía. Hay veces que se tiene tres patas que se anclan anterior y posterior a la coracoides, o superior e inferior, e inferior una pestaña. Es una guía que solo se utiliza para poner el PEC central, la guía central, digamos, sobre la que se arma toda la cirugía. Muy bien. Está bien. Now this is a question for Dr. Ricchetti. As uh, you don't use usually uh, guides to put your pin, if you can give us any tip you use interoperatively to guide uh, the right uh, orientation and location of the pin. I think it depends on the system you use with the different systems that actually have augmented components available. They have instrumentation within their systems that allow, allow you to place the guide pin with the planned augment. So the Depew system, the Tournier system, although it's standard instrumentation, has uh, augmented guides to allow you to correct to what you think is the correct position from the preoperative plan. So it allows you to use a preoperative plan with standard instrumentation in a patient-specific way. So for example, if you're going to use a seven millimeter augment with a step, there's a seven millimeter guide. If you're going to use a 35 degree wedge, there's a 35 degree wedge guide. So there are, there are um, wedge specific guides to allow you to put the guide pin in the correct position, even if you don't have PSI tools available. Okay. Thank you. And there is a question from the audience for Dr. Niton. Uh, and it's uh, if when you place uh, the glenoid component uh, in a glenoid that is uh, that has an inclination of more than 10 grades, if there is uh, any risk to have a, a scapular spine fracture uh, in with the with putting the long superior screw. Did you have? Yeah. Uh, so, scapular fracture is a is a specific complication of reverse, and it's a serious one. It's a it's a milestone in the history of the patient, and we we should we should make anything we can to avoid it. However, uh, we have to fix the base plate with screws. That's that's the current technique, and we have another, we have no other option today to to do so. And I fully agree that in some of the cases that were reported that one of the screw, and especially the super ones, are acting like a stress riser there. However, can we consider that this stress riser is the reason why these fractures occur? I'm not sure, because most of these fractures on the spine aspect These patients sustain a traumatic event. It's a fall. It's a fall on the scapula, and then you have a fracture. 
And that fracture is likely to occur where the stress riser is acting during that trauma, where the energy goes. Because otherwise, how can we explain the thousands of patients that have been operating since the late 90s in Europe and France with using screws with different lengths that never sustain any scapular fracture? So I agree that the screw is acting as a stress riser in a traumatic situation and that you will end up with the diagnostic tools that you will see that the fracture line is going to the tip of the screw but we cannot say today that the screw is responsible for the fracture. Thank you. And uh, one last question for all of you uh, is that which type of graft do you prefer for revision cases that has glenoid bone loss? If you use it, no? So my experience with bone grafting with the reverse come for, comes from the, the, bio, uh, the, the original bioassay that was designed for only lateralization purpose. So it's a, I have a great experience of harvesting the bone graft from the human head. Different uh, guiding techniques were developed by, the, by Pascal Boileau with the Tournier company. And uh, I kept the, the habits of, of doing it like this. And now we have asymmetric uh, possibilities uh, to get uh, manually shaped and uh, partially manual and partially guided shaped uh, bone grafts from the humeral head. Okay, thank you. Maxi, vos alguna preferencia? No, oh, si, si el paciente tiene cabeza humeral, usaríamos la cabeza humeral. Si el paciente no tiene cabeza humeral, porque es una revisión de una prótesis primaria, por ejemplo, la glena eh, no la podés llenar con la cabeza, usaríamos cresta. Y si no estuviera tampoco disponible la cresta, sería un alograf. En ese orden, cabeza humeral, cresta y alograf de acuerdo a la disponibilidad. Estoy de acuerdo con Maxi. Eh, lo único que, que el, el injerto en una primaria... Lo uso para corregir versión, no tanto para lateralizar, y lateralizo entonces con, con la glenosfera, en comparación con, el, con Dr. Newton, que usa el BioRSA que lateraliza con el injerto. Ok, perfecto. I would, uh, I would say for the, re, you know, in the primary setting, I also use a resected humeral head. Um, in the revision setting, it depends on the defect. If I have a well-contained defect with good intact peripheral bone, I'll use cancellous allograft for bone grafting, but an uncontained defect, I have typically used autograft iliac crest, um, which requires a separate uh, surgical site, but is very high quality bone that you can size to fit the defect. And we've reported good outcomes with that technique. I know people also used a uh, structural allograft like femoral allograft, but the iliac crest autograft has worked uh, well in my experience and in our experience. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much. No more questions from the audience. Lucho, Luciano, I don't know if you have any question or something to add. No, oh, creo que estaríamos, Maxi, si te parece. Sí, perfecto. Muy bien. Listo. Okay, uh, thank you very much to all of the participants. It was a pleasure for us. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Eric. Gracias, Maxi. Thank you, Jose. Um, it was very interesting for all of us. And we hope that this was not the first, it was, this was the first one, but not the last one. Um, well, thank you again. And we, we hope to see you in the future in another webinar. Yes. Okay. Uh, gracias, gracias a todos. Gracias, Maxi. Thank gracias, Lucho. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for the invitation. Bye-bye, Jose. Okay, gracias. Bye. 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 Bye.